1 Timothy chapter 6. You turn in your Bible there. This is going to be the last part of the expository study of the book of 1 Timothy. And uh, if you've been with us through all the other chapters, um, I trust that you have learned something. And the Lord has shown you things through His Word. So, we're going to finish up here. This is a really interesting chapter of the Bible. Um, definitely some really neat verses, some very key scriptures that are going to be important to you as a Christian. Some things that you're going to need to learn from this chapter that will help you avoid trouble in your life. All right, so let's get started here. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. You say, okay, well then that's talking about the employee-employer uh, relationship, right? No, it's not. What that's talking about there is servants under the yoke and masters. You say, well, that wouldn't be slavery, would it? Yeah, actually it would. You see, the King James Bible does teach the thing of slavery. Not that you should have slaves and you and thou shalt have slaves or something like that. No, it's just simply slavery was accepted all throughout history. You know, you have one tribe defeat another tribe. Those people, as an act of mercy, a lot of times instead of killing them, you just took them to be your slaves. It was done to the Jews. It was done to the descendants of Ham in particular. Uh, it was done to a lot of different peoples. Uh, you become the bond servant of your captor. Okay, that's just a fact of history. That is not some kind of a great injustice that was devised by the wicked white people. Uh, that's nonsense. All right, that's your modern day uh, revisionist history that tries to revise the truth of the past. Um, many, many cases, slavery was not a bad thing. There are many laws in the Old Testament saying that they're to be very kind to their slaves. Okay, it's not, a, it's not this great horrible evil that people try to make it out to be. So, and you can, if you want more information, all the scripture and everything else, you can listen to our sermon, uh, Does the King James Bible Teach Slavery? For more information on that. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. And, and by the way, let me say this before we continue. There is an application there to the employer-employee type of a thing there that you should be a good worker. Okay, that's taught elsewhere in scripture. You should be a good worker so that they don't mock the word of God. That's important. But let's look here at verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Okay, so they're teaching otherwise, and they're not consenting to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ found? Well, primarily in the four Gospels. Now, the whole book is God's Word. I understand that. And, of course, you have people that don't even consent to the Bible, so they... they do qualify there. But primarily you have people that do not consent to the words that Jesus spoke that are recorded in the, in the four Gospels mainly. Okay, You have three basic groups there. Number one, you would have the hyper-dispensationalist. Now the hyper-dispensationalist is somebody that says only the Pauline epistles, not even the whole book of Acts is for a Christian today. Only the Pauline epistles, the later part of the book of Acts up to um, Philemon. Okay. And then Hebrews to Revel through Revelation is for the tribulation saint. You have that. Okay, so, but you have a problem there because you're supposed to consent to the words of Jesus Christ, which are found in the Gospels. Now, you have to rightly divide that stuff. There were things that Jesus was saying to the Jewish people. So you have to go through there. Matthew 24 is a great example of that, where Jesus is speaking to the Jew that's going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, there are no Christians in Matthew chapter 24. So you do have to rightly divide, but you can't ignore those portions of Scripture. And many people try to put that thing on us as dispensationalists. They try to say, you know, well, you're a dispensationalist, so you ignore the Gospels. No, that's a hyper-dispensationalist, and I do not teach that. I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. A hyper-dispensationalist is somebody that teaches that John, James, Peter were one body, they were the first body, and Paul and Christians up to the rapture are another body. There are two bodies of Christ. That's satanic heresy. 
They also ignore the Gospels. Okay, I'm not a hyper dispensationalist. I'm a dispensationalist. All right, important to get that. The second group there would be the modern day Bible scholars of the Alexandrian school of thought. Okay, they don't consent to wholesome words. All right, they don't consent to this book. They'll tell you, well, no, no English translation can be inspired. No translation can be inspired. They'll actually say that too, in spite of the fact that there are translations all throughout the King James Bible, all throughout what would have even been the original autographs, there are translations. You have Joseph speaking to his servants in the Egyptian tongue, yet it's written down in Hebrew. You have many times where Jesus and the disciples are quoting from the Hebrew Old Testament, but it's written in Greek, you know. And they weren't reading from the Greek Septuagint, so don't give me that nonsense. That stuff's kooky. Okay, the Greek, Greek Septuagint came after the Bible was finished. All right, don't fall for that nonsense that they were using a Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament. That's nonsense. Okay, that's why Jesus referred to one jot or one tittle. Those are Hebrew letters, so why would he refer to Hebrew letters if he's reading a Greek translation? Duh. But anyways... The third group there that does not consent to wholesome words would be your Catholics. And uh, you say, Amen, brother. What about Methodists? How about Lutherans? You say, well, now, come on now, brother. Those are Protestants. And we're all Protestants, aren't we? If you're a Christian, you're a Protestant. No, I'm not a Protestant. I do protest the, the abuses of Rome, but I don't, don't seek to reform the Catholic Church. You know, I'm not a Protestant ref, you know, reformer. No, the fact is, I condemn the Methodists and the Lutherans right along with the Catholics because the Catholics have their catechism, so do the Lutherans. And the Methodists have their Book of Discipline. See, so anytime that you're introducing foreign things that have equal authority or even sometimes greater authority than the King James Bible itself, now you're not consenting to wholesome words. Okay, because when you have to... Consent means that you are basically submitting to these wholesome words. Now, if you have the Bible say one thing and you say, I don't like that, let's go see what divine tradition says. Say, aha, oh, problem. And uh, before you get excited and you say, well, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, don't, you know, indict Baptists with that whole thing. Well, I hate to tell you this, but independent fundamental Baptists are just as guilty as the other groups in many, many, many places. They have many traditions that have no basis at all in Scripture, and yet they're elevated to the same authority as Scripture. See, anybody that's not consenting to wholesome words there, it says there in, uh, well, actually, we'll go on to verse 4 here. We'll go on to this next. We'll, we'll get the description. If you're not consenting to those wholesome words, here's what the Lord says about you. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 4. He is proud knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Okay, the ultimate act of pride is placing yourself above Scripture and treating all Bibles as less than your level of intellect. That's the ultimate act of pride that there is. And that's one of the greatest sins that's very prevalent right now in our world. These new perversionists, are the ones that are doting about questions and strifes of words. You say, well, King James Bible believers do it too. Yeah, but you see, we give you a standard. See, I don't come out and say, you know, debate over Greek and Hebrew and stuff like that, and then give you nothing as a standard. Here's the standard right here. King James Bible. This book is above me. I'm not above it. If this book condemns a sin that I'm doing, then I submit to the book. I don't try to change the book to match my level of stupidity, like a lot of you do out there, new versionists I'm talking about. You're a King James Bible believer, you're just, you know, you don't take what I'm saying as a personal attack because you don't change the King James text. But these people, they come out and they say, well, I think a better translation should be, well, actually, you see, the meaning of the Greek word here is this, or uh, manuscript so-and-so says this or that or whatever, and we know for sure that, okay, what's the standard? The King James Bible is not the standard what is. You say the original autographs. Or you go, say it this way. We'll go to the next step. King James isn't the standard. Okay, what is? Greek and Hebrew. Okay, which ones? There are many different, you know, there's something like 40 different Greek texts out there, you know. Uh, which one? The Alexandrian line? The Texas Receptus line? Which one? 
which edition of which you know thing and all that stuff. So you got a problem there. What about Hebrew? There are multiple Hebrew texts. So you say, okay, what's the standard? The original autographs. Really? Where are the original autographs? They don't exist. So your standard is something that does not exist. See? That's the end philosophy of the Alexandrian school of thought. And what is it? Pride. You don't want to submit to a book. You see, if this book is God's word, then that means that anybody can know the truth. Be they scholar, priest, professor, or laity. You know, the common man working there at the construction job, or working at McDonald's, or working whatever, washing dishes, scrubbing toilets. He can know as much Bible as the professor. Oh boy, that's what they hate. That's why they want to usurp the authority of this book. They want to say, you have to come to me to understand Greek and Hebrew. You know, uh-huh. No, you don't. King James Bible is all you need. And the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 through 29 says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. What's a scribe do? They continually talk about questions and strifes of words. Hmm. John chapter 7. You can turn there in your Bible. This is a good one. John chapter 7, verses 14 through 18. John chapter 7. Okay, it says here, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? <laughs> I mean, you love, you know, I, I always love reading that thing. It's just like the height of absurdity. Here's God manifest in the flesh, and these stupid idiots, these scribes, are saying, How does this man know anything? He doesn't have any letters. You know, he's not a doctor. He's not a rabbi. He's not a PhD. You talk about the height of... of ignorance, of prideful ignorance and arrogance, saying to God manifest in the flesh, hey, you don't, have, you don't have any education. What's Jesus respond? Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. There you go. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and, un, and no unrighteousness is in him. The way you can tell if somebody's really right or not is what are they trying, what's the end result of where they're trying to get you? If they're trying to get you to worship them, then it's not God, the power of God that they're speaking by. If it's somebody that's preaching to you and they're getting you to this book and saying, don't come to me, to the book. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible says, thus saith the Lord, the Word of God says. Then you can listen to that guy at least and check him out according to Scripture. See, if I have the standard in and of myself, I can stretch it, I can change it whenever I feel like it. But if I give you a perfect standard that you too can hold in your hands, then you can see if I'm being honest with you or not. That's the whole issue here. But let me just say this. You know, the verse we read there, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 4, says about uh, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Let me ask you a question. Would you envy me if I was here on doing this video and I told you that I could speak 20 different languages, including biblical Hebrew and Greek? Would there be some envy on your part of me? Sure, there would. Absolutely. Why? Because I would obviously have a higher intellect than you. And if I was standing here and I would say, now let me explain something. Now you wouldn't be able to get this from reading the text. Okay. But you see here where it says envy. Now the Greek word there is such and such. Now if you put the accent over here on this particular portion, as is done in papyrus fragment number 46 of the Byzantine era, you know, if I, if I do that, 
you know, you'd start feeling, oh boy, this guy's really smart. I'm kind of dumb, you know. But if you've watched this project or this this channel long enough, you know that I'm not a scholar in terms of uh, some. I'm not a scribe, I should say. Uh, I do know the Bible version issue. I do know a lot of different things there, whatever. But the point is, I don't push my intellect or something on other people. You know, you see me. I most of my videos I do one take. I have to really mess up bad before I'll say no. I have to redo that thing over again. <laughs> and so you get to see all the errors and all the blunders and things and you know bugs flying past my face and me swatting things and making mistakes and writing my notes out wrong. You know, I'm real. That's the whole thing. Uh, if you ever meet me in person, you'll see that this is exactly the way I am. I don't put on a special presence when I'm before the camera. That's just the way I am. Okay, uh, I don't want people to envy me, to think that I'm some kind of a super intellect or something like this. I'm not interested in that. I don't want worship. All right, you worship God. Don't worship me. That'd be the dumbest thing that you could do. I'll fail you. Keep watching the project. You'll see that. <laughs> um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. We'll go there next. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Hmm. Very interesting thing here. Let's look at this. Let's break this down. First you have perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. What's a perverse disputing? Second Peter 3 verse 16 says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. One of the things that you get somebody who is into this whole scribe mindset, they will rest the scriptures because they are unlearned and unstable kind of funny because they try to come out and say that they're educated and that they're super intelligent and all this stuff the bible says that they're unlearned and unstable hmm very interesting and they'll change the text because they can't understand the verse and it's funny because many many times i've seen these these scholars you know and i read their stuff and read their books and things and they'll say this obviously is a mistranslation because this does not make any sense you know uh ryrie Dr. Ryrie, good example. Um, he, I, my, I actually was looking at a Ryrie study Bible, and back in Revelation chapter 13, it talks about the mark of the beast. And it says that the mark is in the right hand or in the forehead. And Dr. Ryrie says, well, obviously this is a mistranslation because nobody could have a mark in their hand or in their forehead to buy or sell things. Ha, 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 you know, what foolish translators. Well, the problem is there, the, the uh, good doctor, who, by the way, worked on the NIV translation team, the Dr. Ryrie, uh, he, came, he had actually written that commentary back probably in the 50s or 60s, you know, before they had uh, implantable microchips. So uh, Dr. Smarty Pants there, you know, was not, you know, he should have waited a little bit longer before he opened his mouth. But see, he came out to, to show you that he's a smart, intelligent guy and laughed at the King James text. He was unstable and unlearned, and he tried to rest it. He said, obviously, the translation here should be on and not in. See, he changed the text in the footnote, you know. He changed the text. And the NIV that he worked on, the translation team that he worked on, they actually say on and not in for the mark of the beast. See, he rested the, the text and the... Our verse here says that um, in Second Peter chapter three verse sixteen that we just read there it says as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Now I believe that if a man purposefully changes the word of God, I believe that that man uh, has his part taken out of the book of life, as it says back there in Revelation chapter twenty two. I think that's the most serious sin that you can do. Very 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 wicked, very bad. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Hmm. There's no greater lie than changing, perverting the word of God. And you see it there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. 
that's what every new version is. Perfect description. It'll just put that, just take that, those words right there and just tape it right to a new version. This is a perverse disputing warning. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. <laughs> That's what you should put on the new versions because that is what they are. They are a perverse disputing. I mean, why do you need a new version every every year or two? Doesn't even make sense. Why? Because it's for money, which we're going to get into in just a little bit here. What about the next part there? Destitute of the truth. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Okay? We have a standard in this life, this book. The word of God is the truth. That's the standard. So, why would you try and pervert that? Why would you try and mess with it? See? Bad idea. John chapter 8, verses 43 through 47. It says here, Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Hmm destitute of the truth. And you get these people and they're Christians, good, fine Christians, and they hate the truth, they cover up the truth, they attack you for preaching the truth, but they're a Christian? I don't know about that. I don't believe that. What about the last part there, verse 5? Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Huh. What about that? Very interesting there because we have now for the first time here in these last couple hundred years we have Christians, Bible believing Christians meeting in pagan phallus houses. And now we have quote unquote Christian churches that are enormous. Bigger than grocery stores. Bigger than shopping malls. What is this? People say well God must be in it because look how big it is. No. That's not the standard. You see, in fact, I would say it's exactly the opposite. If you see some big thing, what, whatever is highly esteemed among men, the Bible says it's an abomination in the sight of God. So you see some giant mega church, and they're dealing with tens of millions of dollars in a year, and they got 30, 40,000 members or something like that, you are dealing with a first-rate antichrist center. Guaranteed. I guarantee you. I mean... You know, here we are in the in the end times, and you're going to get thousands of people together and do a great work for the Lord. Come on, yeah, sure. But you see, what a lot of these people will do, and this is a big thing. One of the attacks they'll say, well, if the King James Bible is right and it's the only true Bible, then what about men like Chuck Swindoll or or Billy Graham or you know all these big guys, huh? Well, what are they doing? They're supposing that gain is godliness. They think that these guys that are big shots, that are well known, they must be godly because they're well known. Uh, no, that's not the Bible standard. That's not how it works. And you say, well, what should I do about these people? From such, withdraw thyself. Bye-bye. If you're attending one of these big modern mega churches, leave it. You say, well, Brian, maybe I ought to pray about it. You don't need to pray about it. Okay, I don't need to pray about, you know, get up in the morning and say, you know, Lord, should I eat today? Uh, there are some things you don't need to pray about. The Lord gives you common sense. You get to, late at night and you're starting to get tired. You, you don't sit down and say, Lord, please show me if it's your will for me to sleep. You know, you, gotta, you start getting some pain down here in the lower area and you say, I don't know if it's the will of God for me to go to the bathroom. No. <laughs> There are some things that are common sense. And if you're going to some big modern mega church and the, and the guy's preaching prosperity and whatever else, and you just found this channel, get out of it. Don't even go back. Don't darken the door with your shadow. <laughs> you know, run, flee that thing. They're making merchandise of you. That's all they're interested in. All those nice little programs that they have for you and the kids and all the other, you know, stuff. You know, there's a lot of bugs out today. Excuse me. All those little programs that they have, 
it's to get your money. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a mega church in this area, and it's got like singles bars, and it's got coffee shop, and it's got a bookstore, and all this other stuff. What's it there for? To make merchandise of the people. They can care less about your soul. Get out of that place. And of course, you know, the new perversion channels on YouTube, you know, anybody that uses new perversions or, or you know, promotes this whole modern church agenda, their views are going to be enormous. Their subscribers are going to be huge. You know, King James Bible believers are always going to be a very small little number. We're not going to be real popular. Why? Because gain is not a measure of godliness. You know, the Lord's only interested, the Lord's not interested in the majority of people. Okay? He's interested in that small select group that comes to Him and is not willing to compromise, that says, I want the truth and I don't care what it costs me. See? You can't have the truth of God's word and have the world too. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's just as simple as that. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. That's rough, isn't it? You say, what's rough about that? Do you have food in your stomach and clothing on right now? You say, yeah. That's all you need. Let us be there with content. Hey, later on this afternoon, a hurricane comes through, wipes out your whole house. You lose all of your belongings, all your family pictures, all your uh, mementos from school and mementos from whatever, everything. You lose it all. But the clothes on your back and the food in your stomach. The Bible says you should be content. That's why I said it's rough. <laughs> you know. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you have more than food and raiment? You say, well, yeah, I have quite a bit more than food and raiment. Okay. Have you thanked God for that? Because if you have more than food and raiment, you are very blessed. Very blessed. See, God doesn't promise you a whole lot in this life, right? Now, the Lord will bless you. The Lord will do things for you. I'm not saying that you got to have, reduce yourself to food and raiment and that's it and that's all you can ever have. I didn't say that. You know, the Lord will, the Lord will do things for you and the Lord will bless you and, and stuff. That's, that's great. But really, you don't really have a right to complain before the Lord until you're reduced to less than food and raiment. See, as long as you have food and raiment, you really should be content. Hmm. Rough, isn't it? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Now here we go. We start getting into the thing of covetousness. Love of money. First Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Okay? You can turn in your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, by the way. Um... While we're talking here, I want to, or while you're turning there, I can say a couple more things. Notice it does not say they that are rich, they that will be rich. In other words, they're making it, they're purposing in their heart to say, I want to be rich, I want to have lots of money. Those people there are the ones that fall into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in uh, destruction and perdition. You say, okay, well, uh, I don't know if I agree with that, Brian. All right, how about if I give you an example? How about the richest man that ever lived? What did he have to say? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. Let's read this quick. So he says here, this is King Solomon writing. It says, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired I kept not from them 
I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, I was very happy and had total peace and never had sorrow. Right? Uh, no, it actually says, Behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Huh? The wealthiest man that ever lived, and we're going to see about that here in just a minute, but the, the wealthiest man that ever lived, and he says, all these things, all these riches, all this stuff, just people waiting on him hand and foot, coming and singing beautiful music for him. And here's a new treasure we found for you. And here's this, and here's gold, and here's silver, and here's, let's build some more houses for you. And let's build, let's put in some ponds here. And that's all the fruit trees that you want. Whatever kind of fruit you want, King, we'll bring it for you. And everything, just waiting on him hand and foot. And he looks at all of it and he goes, that's so vexing. What a bunch of vanity. What a waste. Huh. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Very interesting. Now let me just say this. Not one man or woman today can ever achieve Solomon's level of wealth and power. Nobody. You say, what about Rothschild? Nope. Nope. Sorry. Rockefeller? Nope, oh, sorry. Any of them? Donald Trump? Nope. Uh, Bill Gates? Bill Waste? You know, Gates? Uh, no, sorry. Oprah Winfrey? Are you kidding me? You know, I mean, nobody. Nobody can achieve this level. You say, prove it, okay? I was hoping you'd say that. First Kings chapter 10, verse 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. Interesting number. Okay, and you can listen to my sermon, The, the uh, World's Greatest Celebrity, for more information on that. But uh, the fact is, it was 666 talents of gold in one year. You say, what is that? Well, it's approximately a little over 33 tons of gold. Tons. Now, if you want some people to laugh at you, walk into a precious metal shop or some kind of a we buy gold or one of these places or whatever, and say... How much, uh, if I was interested in buying 33 tons of gold, what would that cost be? And you'll get a bunch of people laughing at you, thinking you're crazy. Why? Nobody's going to get their hands on 33 tons of gold right now. Uh-uh. No way. Not going to happen. Let me prove that. 66,600 pounds. By the way, a talent uh, there said 666 talents. A talent, there are a lot of different arguments there. Some say 50, 70, 80, some 130 whatever. We'll just round it off at about a hundred, just for the sake of the argument. You'd figure maybe a little less or something, whatever. But just for the sake of this, about a hundred pounds is one talent. So 666 talents would be 66,600 pounds. You know, divide that by 2,000, you get your 33. But uh, 66,600 pounds times 16 ounces, 16 ounces in a pound, would be 1,065,600 ounces of gold in one year. Okay? There again, type it in on eBay or type it in whatever, a one ounce gold coin. Check it out. It's going to cost you probably $1,300 or more right now. And gold is way down from what it was in the past. Okay? So, let's check here. 1,065,600 ounces of gold at about 1,300 an ounce, we'll say, would be 1 billion, with a B, 385,280,000 of physical gold in one year. You say, well, we could, you know, we could get a billion dollars in a year, Brian. Okay? Let me just give you a little lesson in history. You see this? Let me just put this down for a minute here. Put my Bible down. That's my notes. This is important. Um, okay. I'm getting to it. Okay. Now. 
you see that? One dollar bill, twenty dollar bill. They're both the same size of paper. You say, I don't believe it, okay. See? They're cut the same. I'm gonna ask you a question. What's the difference in material between the two of these? Same amount of paper, same amount of ink. You got it? This one here has a 20 painted on it, printed on it. This one here has a $1 printed on it. And you know, you can go to the bank and you can get one that has a 100 printed on it. What's the difference? Nothing, just a different number. You know what that is? Fake. This isn't real money, folks. You can watch, or um, I need to actually redo this sermon. I did a sermon a while back on gold and silver, and uh, things have been changing on that whole front there too, so I need to redo the sermon. But uh, the fact of the matter is, under the Constitution, you're not supposed to have anything but gold and silver coins as a payment of debts, both public and private. What are we doing with Federal Reserve notes? Why did we get paper? George Washington came out and said that uh, there's no greater enemy to the working man than a paper dollar. We got them. And you know the worst part? Most people don't even use these anymore. You know what they use? Credit cards. Huh. Which is what? Numbers on a computer? That's all it is. People don't use real money anymore. So you say, I think somebody could get, you know, a billion dollars. Well, maybe a billion dollars in fake money. Maybe they could type it into the computer that you just made a billion dollars in a year. But you aren't going to get a billion, over one, you know, $1.3 billion in physical gold. Nobody's going to see that thing. I guarantee it. You are not going to see that kind of money anymore. I don't care who it is. I don't care what rich man or whatever else. Nobody is going to be able to come up with or make $1.3 billion of physical gold in one year. No one. Banker, movie star, whatever. Nope, sorry. Not even close to Solomon's realm. Not going to happen. And by the way, that was just gold that Solomon made there. 666 talents of gold in one year. That doesn't count silver, which the Bible talks about that they actually didn't even care much about silver. It was just like kind of a scrap metal. Um, that doesn't count silver. It doesn't count cattle. It doesn't count all the other physical possessions that Solomon had. He was wealthy to the point where we can't even fathom it. All right. Incredible. And yet, this man, with all the money that he made, he wasn't happy. He wasn't satisfied. But you know some kind of a new route that he didn't know. You know, if you're watching this and you're not convinced and you're saying, well, maybe I could become a celebrity or something and become a millionaire or whatever, and I'd be happy. Uh, there again, look at the Hollywood celebrities. Why are they doing drugs? You don't need to do drugs if you're happy. You do drugs to forget reality. You don't need to get drunk out of your mind because you're happy. You get drunk out of your mind to forget your problems. That's what's going on. Things in this life are never going to satisfy. Okay. What happened to King Solomon, by the way, if you don't know? 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 4 through, let's see where are we reading to here, 13. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned away, or was tar turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which, was, which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, 
and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it for the David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to the, thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen. So God actually pronounces a curse upon King Solomon because he's, his heart was turned away from the Lord. What caused it? His strange wives. Why did he have strange wives? Because of his riches. If he'd have been a common man, not much money, he wouldn't have been able to, you know, how's he going to provide for a thousand women? You know, 700 wives, 300 concubines. He couldn't provide for them. It takes a lot of money to provide for 1,000 women, you know, so a little bit, you know, birthdays would be a pretty interesting time, anniversaries too. But let me ask you a question. The Bible said there that they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Question, how many wealthy Christians do you know that are really on fire for the Lord? I've never met any. The Christians that I know that really, really have the big houses and the fancy, nice sport utility vehicles and, you know, Mercedes, Benz, cars and whatever else and BMWs and, you know, all the, all the money, uh, they never amount to much. Why is that? Well, the more junk you have, the more time you have to spend taking care of that junk. If you have a 10-bedroom house with six bathrooms, well, guess what? Either you're going to have to clean all that stuff yourself, or you're going to have to have somebody clean it for you. Which means you've got to pay their salary, which means you've got to work more. See? And you say, well, i got a yacht, and i got a, a nice vacation home, and I have a this, and I have that, and we go vacationing in Europe and stuff like that. That takes time. You don't have time to serve the Lord when you're that rich. See? Interesting. And let me ask you a question. What would happen if God gave you $10 million tonight? What would happen? Well, at the very least, you'd have to take, if it's a check, we'll say, you'd have to take that check to the bank, wouldn't you? And you'd probably have to have set up a special account for that $10 million. And you'd probably have to start thinking about how am I going to spend this money and how am I going to do this and how am I going to do that. And I really should have a different house because this house is, you know, needs work and whatever. And so you'd start to going out and you start doing all these other things. You'd forsake the work of the Lord, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Why? They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. It's right there. Now the next verse here is one of the key verses for a New Testament Christian. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let me tell you something. The easiest way to err in this life, to err from the faith, is to try and get rich. If you start to become covetous, you will wreck your life quicker than anything else that you can do. Okay? It's just a simple, plain fact. You know, I remember somebody said the one time, I don't remember who it was, but they said, you can tell what the Lord thinks about money by looking at the kind of people he gives it to. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> you know, uh, another guy I heard the one time, he said that uh, that um, the corporate ladder is kind of like a pond. You know, the scum always rises to the top. <laughs> it's very true. You know, you want to be a, a big businessman and you want to have a monopoly over a market, what do you got to do? You got to destroy the competition. How can you do that as a Christian? See, it's a problem. All right? Don't make money your goal in life. Don't make this big career and all fancy lands and houses and everything else. You don't want to pursue that stuff. All right? Lay up your treasures in heaven, not here on the earth. All right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. Okay, he's talking about love of money there in the verse before it. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. 
Are you fleeing away from covetousness? You should be. You're to flee these things. Run away from it. And by the way, let me ask you a question there. It said, follow after righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. How can you follow after righteousness? I mean, is there a, something that drives by and it says righteousness and you've got to follow it? No. How do you do this? Turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 3. There's a lot of things that you need to do in this life to preserve yourself, to keep yourself out of trouble, to avoid becoming shipwrecked, like we read about earlier there in the previous studies. Um, and this is going to be one of them. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. Huh. You see, Paul lived a specific kind of a life. It's very interesting too because if you study Paul's life and you study the life of Jesus, there are many things that they had in common. You know, there are many times when Jesus was they were trying to kill him, they were plotting to kill him before he was crucified. Same thing with Paul. You know, Jesus was put down and despised and rejected of men. People forsook him and fled. Same thing with Paul. You know, it's amazing. There's a lot of similarities there. And so you say, you want to be Christ-like. Okay. You start out with Jesus Christ. Then you see Paul. And then you see Christians in the past. That's why it's good to study church history. Real church history too, by the way. And you look at some of these guys back in the 1800s, some of the great preachers and missionaries and evangelists and things. And you'll see a lot of times as you get older as a Christian, you'll have a lot in common with the Christians from the past. It's really neat. What are you doing? Following after righteousness. Very good. See, you want to flee away from covetousness. You want to flee away from trying to be rich. And you want to follow after righteousness. Look at verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Don't just talk the talk, brethren. You're going to have to walk the walk. Okay, you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. And notice it said there, fight. All right? Uh, you're called to be a soldier. I've talked about this before in other studies. Um, there's no option here. Uh, there, is, there are no conscientious objectors in the body of Christ. Either you're going to, you know, you're going to have to fight something. And, uh, I thought I had this written down. Let me just check here quick. Yeah. I'll continue here. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what is the commandment? He says there, Verse 14, that thou keep this commandment. What's the commandment? Fight the good fight of faith. Okay? And here's the thing. If you are saved, you will spend the rest of your days fighting. You say, who am I going to fight? Well, there's four things that you're going to fight. First of all, you're going to fight spiritual wickedness. Read about that in Ephesians chapter 6. Secondly, you're going to fight the lost world. And that's a tough one because... It's not like, you know, the spiritual wickedness. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, you know. And you've got to understand that these people of flesh and blood that are actually fighting against you is because they're being influenced by Satan, all right. They are children of the devil. He's king over all the children of pride, see. So those people that are fighting you, you have to realize what's really behind that situation, you know, some guy comes up and he's, he's rebuking you because you're a Christian or something, and you go over and smash him in the face, you didn't defeat the enemy, okay? Uh, it's the spirit that's deceived him. It's not, you know, physical violence is not going to solve anything. You know, now, unless you're, you know, if your life is being threatened, well, that's a different story. That's self-defense. But offensive? No, we're not called to be offensive in our warfare, all right? Only defensive, physical warfare I'm talking about. Spiritual warfare, yeah, you're very much called to offensive warfare, 
spiritually speaking. But you will fight spiritual wickedness. You will fight the lost world. Thirdly, and here's a good one, you're going to fight the saved professing Christian world. Say, oh, I can't imagine that. We're all, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We won't fight each other. Yeah, you will. You will. If you're newly saved, you know, maybe you haven't experienced it yet, but if you've been saved for a little while, you know what I'm talking about. You've had Christians, and, you know, real ones too. I'm not talking necessarily about the lost, you know, professing ones. They're the worst, but you might have a real true Christian, brother or sister, and they fight you. You know, to the point of splitting up, to the point of, hey, things get real bad. They'll fight you. But what about the fourth enemy that you're going to fight? Well, that's the toughest of all. Because the fourth enemy that you fight is right there. Yourself. The flesh. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. When you are going around and you're thinking that you're really somebody, I can tell you the flesh is already one. When you go around as a Christian and you're saying, boy, I'm no good. Lord, help me not to mess up today. Boy, just help me not to just ruin things. You know, that's when you got things figured out. When you're watching out for yourself and you're saying, Lord, please, if I need to correct something, please tell me how to fix it up. You know, please don't destroy me. I know I deserve to be destroyed, Lord, but, you know, please just take it easy on me and, you know, whatever. That's the right attitude to have. Don't get too high. Don't get puffed up. You know, the Lord might have to bring you back down to earth. Okay? And let me say this. As far as warfare is concerned, again, there's no safe zone. I'll grant you there are places where the fighting is less. You know, you get out into the woods or something like that. Yeah, the fighting's not going to be as bad as in, you know, Times Square or some kind of place like that or... Uh, down in Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood or some kind of deal like, you know, yeah, fighting will be worse there than it is out in a place like this. But this place here is not going to be a sanctuary and you'll never see anything evil or hear anything evil here. Uh, not true. There's no safe zone on this planet. There's no no man's land. Okay? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. It says here, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Very interesting there, who only hath immortality. God is the only source of immortality. There is no other God. There is no other way into heaven. You know, there's no energy of the universe or some kind of new age nonsense. Uh, God and God alone. And it's interesting there, it says about who no man hath seen nor can see. Well, the reason for that, and I've talked about this before in other studies, but God is the soul. He's the one part of the, the Godhead there that is the soul. You can't see a soul, okay, in terms of, you know, uh, the Godhead. Now, I realize in Revelation... That it does say about he saw the souls of them that were slain under the altar. I know that. But in terms of the Godhead, you can't see God the Father. God the Father, when you look at Jesus Christ, you're seeing God the Father. You know, that's the Godhead. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in the store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, notice here, it does not say that it's a sin to be wealthy. Right? If you're doing some kind of a business, and it's a legitimate business, and whatever else, and the Lord really blesses you with money, great. Okay, As long as that's not your goal. You're not to go into the thing, they that will be rich. You know, no. See, then you got a problem. But if you're just doing good, honest, hard work, and the Lord blesses you with money, then those are your verses right there, verses 17 through 19. Okay, and notice it says they're ready to distribute. Don't become cheap. All right. Um, you know, there's a, a whole group here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, called the Mennonites. And, you know, we've kind of taken to call them Mammonites. And uh, there's a reason for that. 
um, they're some of the most cheap people you'll ever meet. I mean, I worked for them and stuff, and I know how things go. I mean, not all, not across the board. Sometimes you'll get one that's that's generous and whatever else, but uh, a lot of them, they're just, they won't give a dime to anyone. They're interested in building their little empire here on Earth, which most of them, <clears throat> most of them believe in uh, replacement theology, and they re they believe in the um, post millennial system of belief. You know, they believe that they have to build a kingdom, so they're building that kingdom. Boy, they're they're getting that money coming in. And you know, there's even a joke. They say, uh, "What's the difference between a canoe and a Mennonite? A canoe will tip." You know, <laughs> as many true, or is you know a lot of truth to that. Um, many of them are that way. But uh, you don't want to be known for that. If God has blessed you with money, then, you know, distribute. You know, the Bible talks about there being equality among the, the body of Christ. You, know, you could do a lot for the Lord with that money. You know, I mean, if you're very, very busy with your job, with your business, and God's blessing you with the money, give to ministries. Give to missionaries. Give to pastors. Give to or preachers. Give to evangelists. Do, people that are doing the work of the Lord. Give the local church Bible publishers. I always point people to them because they're doing a real good work. You know, They are a ministry that's worthy of your support. And I don't work for them too, by the way, so don't get excited. But uh, let's finish up here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 through 21. It says here, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Funny, because most of our modern-day science, science, you know, like evolution and things, and, and uh, climate change, you know, most of that stuff there is designed to overthrow the King James Bible. That's all it's designed for. They're just trying to explain away the Bible. And you say, well, I don't know. I think I can profess to believe in evolution and the Bible. Uh, no, you can't. Those two are contrary to the one to the other. King James Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. Evolution says, no, it came into, into place by random accident. You say, okay, well, yeah, God created the earth, and then he used evolution to get us here. Uh, that's also stupid, because God says that he created man in his own image. So that wouldn't work. We didn't come from a bacteria and work our way up. Okay, And God creates it right the first time, man destroys it through sin. That's the opposite of evolution. Evolution says, no, sin and destruction and war and death is actually the creative process. Survival of the fittest. See? You can't reconcile this stuff. And there's a whole lot of information out there debunking the lie of evolution. It's just nonsense. I mean, just ridiculous. And, you know, Again, that's a whole other subject here. We're not going to be able to get into it. But the fact of the matter is, beware of oppositions of science falsely so-called. And when people start to take you into that realm and vain babblings and all that other stuff, just, you know, whatever. Are you a sinner? You know, get them back to that. According to the Bible, if you died tonight, where, do you, where would you go? That's the issue. That's the main issue here. So... That's going to be it for the expository study of 1 Timothy. Uh, we're through all six chapters here, and uh, we'll be um, probably going to 2 Timothy next. Uh, not sure yet. I have a lot going right now with moving and everything else. Um, I'm recording this sermon, actually, in, a, in early October, but it'll be mid-October till this thing is posted online and until uh, you're watching this. But uh, we have a whole lot of things to do, and so that's why I'm having to do a couple weeks in advance. A uh, lot of subjects, a lot of different studies um, that we want to come out with. And, uh, you know, we're working on a lot right now, so just please be patient with us. Um, and uh, we'll keep you informed of what's going on. So... Uh, trying to think. I guess that's going to be it for now. Um, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your truth. A truth that can keep us out of trouble. 
Uh, we can look at this world, Lord, and we can see that it doesn't take very much education to see that this, the money and the success and the fame that's offered by the lost world is, it doesn't bring happiness, Lord. It didn't bring happiness to King Solomon. It's certainly not going to bring happiness to anybody today. So they're going to bring misery and sorrow and death. And Lord, I just, uh, I pray, Lord, if there are any people out there, any Christians especially, that are starting to fall into the traps of covetousness and loving money, I pray, Lord, that they would get away from that as quickly as possible. They would repent of it and be content with such things as they have. And that they would be happy with the food and raiment, Lord. And, and help us to never take for granted food and raiment, but to be content with those things. And, and Lord, if you bless us with more than food and raiment, to understand that we are very, very blessed. And so, Lord, I just uh, ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thought I had a bug on me. All right. That is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your donations. Um, please keep praying for us as we are uh, in the process of building, moving to Maine. Um, really, really, really looking forward to being totally settled into our new home. Uh, it'll be where we're going to stay from now until the rapture. And uh, Lord willing, anyhow, as long as we aren't taken captive or something by another foreign country, which could certainly happen. <laughs> but um, uh, that's where we're going to be, and we're going to have the ministry there, and, and uh, looking forward to being organized. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.